Oh, a hawk. <laughs> we'll go ahead and put ourselves on mute now. Well, uh, that is just the introduction. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our bird ability broadcast this morning, our bird ability field trip. I'm Dottie Head, I'm with Georgia Audubon, and we are delighted to host this field trip on our Georgia Audubon Facebook page. We also have some people who've joined us via Zoom, so we welcome you all. Um, should you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments or in the uh, chat box if you're in, if you've joined us on Zoom or in Q&A, and I will do my best to feed those to the presenters. Uh, one quick announcement, George Audemont is going to be participating in some phone banking for Auk the Vote uh, on 1219 from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, on December 29th from 6 to 8 p.m. and on January 3rd from 3 to 5 p.m. So if you're interested in joining us for, for that phone banking, um, please reach out to us in the chat. We can connect you with Karina and give you some more information. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Karina Newsom, the Community Engagement Manager for Georgia Audubon to introduce the people who are joining us today. Karina, it's all yours. All right, thank you so much, Dottie. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this morning for our BirdAbility virtual field trip. Uh, George Audubon is so excited uh, to be able to partner with BirdAbility, um, which you'll hear more about in a second, for monthly virtual field trips. Um, so we're going to be highlighting uh, accessible trails in various parts of the country, always including Georgia, but then including some mystery cities around the country as well. Um, highlighting the accessibility challenges that people might experience when they are outside and getting the chance to look at birds, of course, from around the country, which is always exciting. Um, you get to do some traveling while sitting right at home in the comfort uh, of maybe your couch. So um, I am going to go ahead and open it up to um, introduce our guest today. And we'll go ahead and start um, with Virginia Rose, who is joining us. Virginia, feel free uh, to introduce yourself to our guest today. I think Virginia's mic is on mute. <laughs> Let's try One that again. Second. Perfect, yep. Sorry guys. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Georgia Audubon. Thank you everybody for showing up this morning. I'm Virginia Rose and founder of BirdAbility. I'm here today at Lake Creek Trail. It's a beautifully accessible trail uh, with all kinds of great habitat. I also wanted you to see the parking space you can see my van is right here parked in a perfect handicapped spot um, and we'll be looking at trails that you can see here uh, pretty much cement trails throughout so thank you for joining us all right let's go over to joe I know you have hey guys uh, i'm joe watts i'm a, a board member for alabama audubon and i'm also on the national audubon society's board um and i kind of missed we had a couple of, of other alabama audubon folks out here checking out the uh, the scene and checking out what birds we're hoping to see yesterday and the day before there were some great birds out here right now it looks like there's some mute swans uh we're at limestone park uh in shelby county which is about 30 minutes south of birmingham alabama and um we can tell you guys more about that later and i'm gonna flip it over to linda if that's okay there you are there I am. hey hi guys i'm linda neighbors um member of alabama audubon and um i guess i'm the bird ability person today. I have an old spinal cord injury and um, I have also have been a physical therapist for 30 plus years. So um, my spinal cord injury was such that I was ambulatory with assistive devices for quite a while. And, but as arthritis has gotten worse in my knees, I have um, gone more and more to my wheelchair. And so yeah, this is a great site out here and we are glad to be with you guys. So we, if the rain will come on through, we might actually see a bird or two, you never know. Awesome, thank you so much. And we'll go head over to Freya. Hi everyone, my name is Freya McGregor. Uh, I'm at Bernheim Arboretum and Research Forest, which is in Kentucky, um, not that far south of Louisville. Uh, it's, it's cold and wet. 
here today, but um, there's a few birds around. I've got my husband, Patrick, here helping me spot birds. Uh, and um, I'm an occupational therapist. I'm part of BirdAbility with Virginia. And uh, I have a dodgy knee, which is a very unmedical diagnosis, but no medical specialist can tell me what's going on. So we're going to stick with dodgy for now. Um, something's up with it. Um, I have some trouble walking sometimes. It's kind of achy and sore and there's trails that I can't manage um, some days and some days I can. So um, accessible trails are really important to me and knowing what kind of a trail it is, if it's a rocky rugged trail or if it's one that's paved with a few benches, that's really important information for me to know if I can manage it or not. So um, I'm looking forward to finding a few birds today with you. Awesome. And so I'm going to go ahead and just quickly describe where I am. Again, my name is Karina Newsom. I'm the Community Engagement Manager with Georgia Audubon. And today I'm at Panola Mountain State Park, which is about 30 or so minutes south of downtown Atlanta on a 100-acre uh, granite outcrop. So a really uh, cool kind of natural feature. Um, the parking lot here at Panola Mountain State Park at the trailhead is gravel but it is paved in the areas where there is, is a handicap parking for two vehicles along with lots of space around those spots in case there's a ramp um, for either of those vehicles and the uh, the trails themselves are paved i'm going to turn it around for you here um, there is lot there are uh, several miles of paved trail here at panola mountain state park along with several um, bridges and the bridges do have a um, a banister that's about usually about three and a half feet tall, um, something to keep in mind when you're thinking about your uh, vantage point. There are also kind of off-road trails here at Panola Mountain um, that are mainly dirt or gravel paved, but there are lots of um, paved roads as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Virginia. If you wouldn't mind telling everyone a little bit about um, the work of Vertability as well as Freya, um, the work of Vertability and kind of some of the work that you're doing um, nationwide to make the outdoors and outdoor exploration as accessible as possible. Am I? Is it Virginia? Yeah. Am I you're good. You're unmuted. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I just wanted to say a little bit about birdability. Um, it was probably two and a half years ago when um, I decided that it was time to bring birding to as many people who had mobility challenges as I could possibly find. So I started off with that mission. Uh, National Audubon picked it up immediately and really essentially gave me the platform that I've had for the last 30 months to help bring people um, into birding. Um, it has really taken off. Birdability captains have been established across the country. We have about 22 birdability captains now representing about 15 or so states and Toronto and Chiapas, by the way, one of the newer ones. So I'm very excited about the ways in which birdability is reaching people who have all kinds of um, accessibility challenges. And it's gone from mobility challenges to access now, access in all ways, access for people who have um, low vision or blindness, people who have various mental um, conditions that keep them from being able to access birding the way any, anybody else could, um, access for people who have um, autism, access for people who are coming from all different walks. Ooh, that's a weird word. <laughs> all different areas. <laughs> anyway, so we are now in the position of making birdability available for all kinds of people and it's just going nowhere but up. I also want to give a big shout out to my Admiral Freya who has really picked this organization up and moved it in fast forward for the last four months. Thank you Freya. Do you want to say a few words about birdability? Sure, thanks Virginia. Um, yeah, so birdability, the other big group of uh, birders or potential future birders, which is anybody who doesn't yet realize they're a birder, uh, and birders who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, so yeah, any and, and anyone who has something like me, a dodgy knee that's not diagnosed, but it impacts their ability to access birding in the outdoors in the way that they would like. So anybody who has accessibility challenges um, where we want to um, try and enable them um, by uh, advocating for accessible trails, sharing accessible trails via the birdability map, which you should check out via the link at birdability.org, our new website, uh, and um, finding, um, creating guidance documents and resources for bird clubs and Audubon chapters and 
bird outing leaders um, to, to empower them to reach out and partner with local, um, maybe the local school for the blind or a local veterans organization or, um, or anybody who, who might experience an accessibility challenge. So we're really excited. Um, things are kicking off, it's, it's exciting times. So um, yay, birdability. Awesome, um, thank you both so much. Oh, go ahead, Bria. Um, I was just gonna say, while, while I've got you, um, I'm just gonna flip my screen over. I'm on the nursery loop trail here at Bernheim. Um, it's, it's asphalt. I would call that bitumen in Australia, but I'm told this is called asphalt in this country. <laughs> it's nice and wide. Um, it's more than 32 inches wide, which is really important. Uh, that's about the, the biggest width that a wheelchair or mobility, um, motorized mobility device might be. So it's nice and wide and, and it should, in fact, it should be more than um, double that so that people can pass each other on this trail. Uh, there's a few benches, although there's a bench like way over there, which is not really <laughs> close to the trail. Uh, there's been a good few birds around um, this morning. There's there's a few um, Carolina chickadees and I've heard a Carolina wren. We had a couple of mallards before and uh, cedar waxwings flew overhead. So, uh, and, and a bunch of Canada geese. So, so that's fun. Oh, and a grateful heron, yeah. Hi everybody, can I interrupt and have, a, we have a question that's come in from um, somebody who has uh, some visual impairment and she finds it difficult to spot birds even through binoculars. Um, people have told her she should quit birding, but uh, she wants to know if she should because she says it soothes her, soothes her. So somebody please give her some advice on how she can keep birding. Um, I was going to suggest ear birding because that's, that's a great new pastime, but you all are certainly the experts. So who can take yeah, that? I'll I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, thanks for asking that question. Um, please don't quit birding. Birding is awesome. Birding is for everybody. Uh, birding by ear is is really awesome. Um, most people who are fully sighted bird by ear in some way or another, you know, you hear a bird and you're like, oh, what's that? Even if you don't know the sound of that bird yet or to ID it by ear. There's a lot of birders who are totally blind who go birding. Um, one of our friends, Jerry Berrier, is totally blind. He's been birding since the 70s. Um, and if, if you go to our website, I'm looking forward to doing a lot more work with Jerry and, and like really learning a lot from him so we can pass it on um, to everybody who's interested in this stuff. But there are lots of ways you can go birding by ear. Uh, on our website, there's a link to during Birdability Week, which was in October and was massively supported by National Audubon. Uh, we had a panel discussion and Jerry Barrier was one of the panelists and he talked a little bit in there about how he goes birding so that might be worth a watch um, you definitely shouldn't give up birding that's there's always a way um, and being out in nature you know there's so many health benefits um, to being out in nature in whatever way that is so please don't give up birding um, and if you wanted to reach out to us um, the contact information is on our website I'd love to connect with you and um, send you some more encouragement and and see if we can find a way to um, make sure that you can keep going birding because Awesome. And, I, and I've listed the websites and the links that you sent Freya in the comment boxes so people should be able to find them there. Amazing. Thank you so much. Well, I just now had um, a small flock of brown headed nut hatches that were in this tree above me. Of course, they all move very quickly. I was trying to, I'm trying to see if I can be quiet enough for you all to be able to hear them. They sound very literally like uh, squeak toys, like if you were to go in PetSmart, find the dog toy section, and squeak away, that is exactly what they sound like. Um, and so uh, here in the Southeast United States where brown-headed nuthatches are found, um, they've actually been listed unfortunately by the um, National Audubon Society as climate endangered because they're pretty limited to living in kind of the longleaf pine ecosystems down here. Um, and as it gets warmer and warmer, they're not gonna like that. They have a pretty low temperature threshold for what they need to survive. And as cooler temperatures are, 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 are moving north, as you have to move north to find cooler temperatures, the habitat they need isn't really up there. So there's kind of a disconnect between the, the habitat they need and the temperatures they need. So we're lucky to be able to see and hear brown-headed nuthatches um, here in, in Atlanta, Georgia and here in the Southeast. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I heard someone uh, jumping in there, but I see that Joe has uh, at least the uh, landscape around where they are right now. Joe, are you seeing those mute swans you mentioned? The mute swans are on another pond, uh, slightly 
slightly south of us, or slightly away from us, not far, but uh, we're kind of under a cover right now, but the rain seems to be let up a little bit. Um, but I did want, I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit about the location that we are in, Limestone Park. Uh, it's a small Tupelo gum swamp, um, kind of one of the northern spots for that in Alabama. And we've had some amazing birds here. Uh, we've had everything from a really common roseate boonbill to um, wood storks just this last year. Uh, we had nesting anhingas here. Uh, no today, of course. Uh, we have a mockingbird right now. Very exciting. Um, but <laughs> we um, let's see. What are the other birds that we we've had a northern harrier here. We had a long-billed dowager recently. Uh, probably 15 minutes ago, we had one of the northernmost uh, uh, limpkins spotted. Uh, maybe about 15 minutes drive from here, about a year ago. Uh, so it's it's and I think locations like this are super important for birds and they're going to become more and more important for birds as the climate continues to change because these northern outposts are going to become more valuable to the birds that have to move north because of climate change. Uh, one of the other things I think the history of this location was it's a it's a location that's been owned by um, I'm going to flip from seeing me which is not particularly lovely to seeing the actual location. Um, and talk one this this park has been owned by the city of Alabaster for a number of years now, and it has been a radio controlled plane uh, location. And this little swampy area has just been kind of forgotten and not dealt with. Um, and Alabama Audubon, about seven years ago, approached the uh, mayor of the city of Alabaster, and we talked about this location and said, we'd like to uh, volunteer to pay for uh, the ramp and the viewing platform that hopefully you guys can see here. Um, it gives access. It's probably not more than eight feet off the ground, um, but it provides a, a way to see into the swamp that otherwise meant you had to wade through a lot of um, just grasses and things. Um, we also created a little meadow where we planted native wildflowers and other native grasses, uh, which has been real popular and I think has helped to bring the birds back. Uh, one of the benefits of doing this, other than just giving people access to a location, is it's put a physical piece of um, building on this property and it turned it from, uh, I guess, about three years ago, the city of Alabaster decided they wanted to make this property a um, location where they could stage their trash pickup um, and a couple of other things and maintenance. And th it was really concerning. And I think if this platform had not been here, um, we would have lost this, this property. But the platform being here made enough people love this location to fight for it and make sure and give it a voice. So um, being a voice for birdability is also being a voice for the birds. But uh, does anybody have any questions about this location? Hey, Joe, I'm just wondering if you might ask Linda. I see that she has a walking cane in her wheelchair. So I wonder if you could ask her a little bit about that uh, and how this, this location means she can go birding. Sure. Uh, Linda, did you hear that question? Yeah. Um, uh, you may have missed it a little earlier I was saying that I, I have an old spinal cord injury um, that was incomplete and for many years I was really ambulatory with just a cane and as the arthritis in my knees have gotten worse I've gone to two canes and now I'm using my chair much more so um, it's really nice to have the ramp um, to get up here to this height because otherwise you really can't see over the grasses into the swamp and I do come out here sometimes with my father who's 89 and elderly and very mobility limited. And we just sort of car burn some, we'll go by the pond, we'll, you know, sort of drive up here into the grasses. And so even just from car burning, it, it works fairly well. Um, and you can see a lot of, um, of the birds. And it's really nice in June when the uh, prairie flowers are blooming this huge patch and it's just this riot of color and um, so 
yeah, it's very helpful to me to have the ramp. I would never be able to get close to this swamp without some sort of um, accessibility. So it's nice, even though, as we said, probably for a lot of people, the sideline on this railing might not be the greatest, but um, it is at least open enough you know, you can kind of go underneath if you have to. It's not optimum, uh, but it can work if you need it to. And to, um, you know, climb up onto the rail and sit with help. <laughs> so that get up really high if my knees don't for long. Um, you all, we've had a couple of more questions come in. Um, Joe, they'd like to know, Joe, they'd like to know what you all are hearing at the Alabama location, and somebody. Um, got onto the question about how do you view birds in the shrubbery and the grasses? Um, what's the best way to get them to pop up so you can see them? Can I just interrupt really quickly before, before sure. we get to Joe and that question, just because we've got to an interesting spot on this trail. So I haven't actually, I haven't actually done this trail before. So we're all discovering this together. And I was told when we arrived that this was one of the accessible trails, but there's a really big difference between like accessible trails and actually accessible trails there's a lot more there's a lot of access considerations that needed to need to be um kind of conformed to we have a bit of a uh, rundown of that on our website um birdability.org uh and the, under the guidance documents there's access considerations and that will explain a bit if you're a bird outing leader for example what you need to be looking for when you're deciding if that trail or birding location really is actually accessible um to to folks but i just got to this spot on the trail it was it was an asphalt trail uh and here we're walking along and oh suddenly it's not <laughs> i didn't know this the sign didn't tell me the person didn't tell me the brochure didn't tell me and i'm a little disappointed i mean i can walk that um but that's sort of not really the point uh and and not everyone just because i can do it doesn't mean everyone who has an accessibility challenge can so i just wanted to throw that out there into the world that just because someone tells you it's an accessible trail um, that's why the birdability map is so helpful. If you know of an accessible birding location, you're, anyone can go and pin that on the birdability map. And there's a little quick survey like with checkboxes so that we can have all that really detailed technical accessibility information in one place so that anyone can get to it if they need to. So, sorry, I just wanted to interrupt about that as we're here Freya, on this trail. Freya, I wanted, I wanted to comment right here because this is a really important point that as you continue along that trail, I want you to try to determine as best you can, you know, with an OTI, how accessible is the dirt trail? Because if the dirt trail is hard packed, some people will be able to continue it. And that is exactly the kind of information that needs to show up on our map. Just because it's crushed granite, just because it's dirt, doesn't mean it's inaccessible for everybody. Thanks. Yeah, right. And so that's why on, on the birdability map, when you submit a little birdability site review to pin a location, we ask, we ask you all those questions so that uh, anyone can determine for themselves if that trail is one they can do. We're, we're just continuing on it now. And it suddenly um, got a whole lot steeper. That doesn't look very steep on my phone, I know. But, you know, that impacts accessibility for a lot of folks. So, um, yeah. Sorry, Joe. It's <laughs> back to you. What are you hearing down there? Can I, can I pop in here uh, just to let you know what we're seeing here in Austin, Texas? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, so we have seen and or heard, what do you say, a dozen birds? Yeah. We were met with a bird's room this morning, bunches of blue jays, maybe 12, 10. Uh, we saw a big fish, great chalk tackles, maybe 25. We have Super heard top. Carolina wren. A cooper's hawk flew right over our parking lot. Turkey vulture just flew over. We had a ruby crown kinglets. Cardinal. We had ruby crown kinglets. We've had um, oh American goldfinch. Oh American goldfinch, and a bunch of yellow rump warblers are smacking in the background. Okay, on to you, Joe. Yeah, I'm trying to, there we go. Um, so far, we've not heard a whole lot, but what we've heard, um, I guess we've heard some cardinals um, wrens. and wrens and a blue jay. The best bird we've probably seen so far today was, um, was a northern flicker, which is the state bird of Alabama. 
Uh, so that was kind of exciting. Um, you'll know the male by the little mustache that he has. Um, it's kind of my favorite bird of all. I love a mustache, uh, even though thankfully I do not have one. Um, my wife would say. Um, but that's most of the birds we've, we've heard. We've seen blue birds. Uh, we had the tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle of um, a Carolina wren earlier. Um, that's about it. It's really pretty quiet right now. There's, the wind has kind of picked up. We're at probably um, 10 or 15 mile an hour wind. Um, it looks like some folks out here are seeing something though. So I'd be curious to know what they're seeing, but I'll, uh, oh, one of the things that I did want to point out that uh, in related to bird ability, um, this bench at this location is super important um, for some people. Some people can walk a um, hundred yards with without any problem, but they really need a spot to rest. And knowing that a bench is every hundred yards or so can, here comes a train, um, can really make a difference in the ability of somebody to enjoy birding outside. So I think in addition to the, to the surface, making note of the benches and the other amenities that are located along the, the, the uh, at the site or on the trail uh, is really important. And I like to know how a, a trail works in terms of birding from your car. Because um, being able to pull up and look at a, um, a beach scene or a lakeshore scene from the automobile and having maybe a, a car mounted spotting scope can make a real difference. So, Linda, do you want to add anything to that? Yep. Yep. All right, I'm going to. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll wait till the train gets gone, and then we'll we'll turn it over to you guys uh, for now. Speaking of birding from your car, um, today the forecast was for rain, and we woke up and it was like forty mile an hour winds, and I thought that's the perfect condition to do a live virtual bird outing. Uh, and so we, <laughs> the backup plan was to come here to Bernheim, but do to broadcast from the car um, because we didn't want to get rained on for an hour. Um, and there's a big lake here uh, and there's a lot of Canada geese out there. So we were going to just show you a whole bunch of Canada geese. But birding from a car is still birding. That counts. So like, if that's how you bird, that's that's awesome. And for those of you who are just joining us, I just wanted to let you know, this is um, a partnership virtual bird outing between Georgia Audubon and BirdAbility. And these virtual bird outings exist to highlight uh, accessible trails, um, people who experience accessibility challenges and their experience in the outdoors and birds from all around the country. So today we have represented here, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. We've also got um, some other folks in different parts of the country. If you wouldn't mind just really quickly going ahead and saying again where you are um, in the world and uh, the general accessibility of the, of the trail on which you are um, traveling today, just very briefly. Virginia, we can start with you. All right, I'm sorry, I totally missed the question. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. I was just really quickly, uh, just quickly reintroducing all of us and where we are in the world. Um, so the city, state where you are, your name, um, just to give people, to reorient people who may have just joined partway through our, our live today. Oh, okay. Celeste, should I, should I be on self now? Sorry, guys, I'm, shouldn't I be on self? Right you, want it, you want it on self to talk? Yeah. I don't know where it is. While well, Virginia's getting organized, I'll just jump sorry, in. Sorry. Um, to give you a Are you ready? I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to do too much. There um, you go. Okay. I'm in Austin, Texas. I am on the Lake Creek Trail. Um, and uh, I just wanted to give you some idea about um, how wonderful that I should do it out of the sun. So you can see this really great. I hope you can see this really great sidewalk. And um, we are looking at um, right now in this beautiful view I have, and I can't show you because I'm not digiscoping, but I have American goldfinch and we have ruby crown kinglets and we have um, Buicks. Helen, what do you have? Great blue down in the creek. I'm getting some other friends to weigh in. Okay, to you Freya. Hi everyone, I'm Freya McGregor. I'm coming to you from Bernheim uh, Forest and uh, Research, sorry, Bernheim Arboretum and Research Forest, which is in Kentucky, about an hour south of Louisville. 
uh, we're on the Nursery Loop Trail, which I hadn't been on before. Unfortunately, not quite as accessible as I'd hoped, but uh, that's, that's all right for me. But it's good to know, and I'll be sure to put all the information about it into the vertibility map so that anyone who wants to can determine for themselves if this is a trail they'd like to tackle. All right, Linda and Joe. Mm. Um, can I, let me interrupt with another question for uh, Freya or Virginia. Somebody is asking if you recommend a straight or angled scope for car mounting. Uh, okay, that's a really good question. Um, actually, I would like to have two scopes. Um, one would be a straight scope so I can use it on my car mount. Um, I actually tried to, I have a scope, a Vortex scope with a um, sort of an uplift eye and it ends up I, that I have to raise my seat so far that my head is hitting the top of my van as I'm trying to crane my eye over the scope and into the view. But so I need a straight scope for the car mount and I definitely use the scope that has the upturned eyepiece for my wheelchair and I attach that scope to a handy dandy little platform and it sits directly under my eye. I'll just jump in there. Um, so as an occupational therapist, oh, some small flighty bird. Um, as an occupational therapist, um, I know I do a lot of work with adaptive equipment and stuff. And so I would just say with the scope question, um, I don't have a scope myself, although I would love one. Um, it depends, oh, it's a Carolina Wren. Uh, <laughs> that, that preference would depend on you I think and so if you're able to try out both kinds of scopes I'm um, in a car maybe um, a local um, store that sells optics would let you like try them out a little bit Not, I'm sure they wouldn't let you have them but just in the car park or something you might be able to see what um, works better for you um, and so I think what Virginia said makes so much sense but it, it may just depend on you so um, if you can try it out do that Awesome. Great question. Uh, Linda and Joe, do you want to go ahead and kind of ability very quickly of the, of the trail um, and location that you're burning from? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? We're just going around and uh, reintroducing ourselves for people who may have joined after the original introduction saying where you are in the world and the like a brief uh, description of the accessibility of the place you are. Uh I'm Joe Watts um, with Alabama Audubon and National Audubon Society Board. Um, we are in li at Limestone Park in Shelby County, which is about 30 minutes south of Birmingham, Alabama, the largest city in the state. Um, and we're watching a variety, well, not a really variety of birds. Uh, we're watching about four or five species of birds. We do have an American coot out in the, uh, the water there. It's a little far to see, so uh, I haven't been able to get it in my camera. But um, one of the other things that I was going to mention is accessible trails are awesome. And one of the challenges is just because it's called an accessible trail doesn't mean it's accessible. I know people have been touching on that. Uh, Linda says amen to that. Um, I was at one of my favorite locations, Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge, yesterday. Uh, we went to pick up kittens. That's another story, uh, but kind of an exciting one. But um, we, on the way there, we stopped at uh, the Beaverton Tower, which is a platform, and at the Beaverton Boardwalk, which is a lovely boardwalk through a sort of similar swamp to here. Um, but it's got a nice gravel, pretty hard packed uh, trail, probably about a third of a mile in, and then it hits a boardwalk. And it's a nice boardwalk that is um, pretty well built and, and, and nice and easy to access, except for the actual access to the boardwalk. It's about a two inch bump up uh, right at the boardwalk where the boardwalk starts from the gravel trail. Um, so I was really disappointed. I've been chatting with the, uh, the uh, park ranger and I, they are working really hard to do that. And they're actually talking about rebuilding the trail. So, I mean, the, the boardwalk, so that's exciting. But um, it's just that little tiny bump to, to me as somebody that uh, has not really any access problems that turns that really wonderful trail into the um, depths of the swamp into something really, really problematic. So. Hey, Joe. Uh huh. Joe, once you start talking to them about the boardwalk, please make sure that they make 
some changes to the railing. Okay, uh, this one is actually the, the, the location I'm talking about. The boardwalk uh, is different than where we are now. Oh, okay. It's about half north, and it actually doesn't have railings. So it's really, uh, other than the fact that you can, you know, fall off. Um, okay. um, it, it's it's really not. It's very bad. Okay. Say it again, Virginia. I'm sorry, uh, Virginia. I I'd rather fall off the boardwalk than not be able to see through railing. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of what I thought. That's what we felt. I mean, it, it's got railings at a couple of locations where the water is deeper, but when it's, you know, it's, it's not, but probably a foot off the, uh, the ground. So, and, and in those locations, there's actually no railing, but there is a bump that keeps you from uh, almost, it would be almost impossible to get over. So have you ever visited there, Linda? No, not that particular one, but it's, you know, it, it makes you think of close to here, you know, probably five miles as the crow flies, there is an area called Ebenezer Swamp, which is a beautiful swamp with a wonderful boardwalk through it. But in order to get to the boardwalk, you have to go through a very grassy field, thick grass, and then you have to go down a trail that, though it's wide, it is... You know, there's tree roots that you have to maneuver over, and if it's been raining, it can be very muddy. I think actually one of our Audubon members, he was in a power chair, got stuck in the mud out there one time. Um, it was not pretty. And so it's great if you can get to the, to the boardwalk, and there again, it's got, you know, a lip probably this high that you've got to bump up over and onto the boardwalk. So it can be problematic unless you've got somebody or more than one somebody is helping you with the bending. Yeah, and I love that location. Uh, other than that, it's a, it's, it's a terrific location in the spring. Uh, it's almost guaranteed place to see prothonotary warblers. They breed there in the summer uh, and it is a fantastic location. And it is, you know, but it is, a, it's a real disappointment and it's, it's sad to, to, to know that someone got stuck there. Uh, and it, it has been, the boardwalk itself is very accessible, but the access to it is a real challenge, so. Hey guys, I just wanted to um, jump in. Oh, walking past some wind chimes, making some pretty noises. Um, I just had a lot of excitement. So Bern, it wasn't quite what I thought it was, just so that you don't get too excited, but um, Bernheim um, has um, a pair of golden eagles that um, spend the winter down here, and they've been spending the winter here for at least five years. Um, the folks at Bernheim have tracking devices on the male and the female. They didn't know, just because they spent the winter here, they didn't know if they uh, were also a mating pair. Um, and it turns out that they are. Uh, the tracking um, magical magicalness uh, showed that both individuals, they, they set off from here on the same day, uh, going completely different directions. And the first year they thought, oh gosh, they mustn't, they mustn't be a mating pair. Uh, and then they ended up um, way up north in Canada, um, I think the story is they arrived at that same place together within an hour of each other, which is kind of insane when you think about the distance and the fact they were completely what? separate the whole time. Yeah, it's, it's wild. So they're named Harper and Athena. Um, I haven't seen them here, but we just heard a sound that sounded kind of like maybe it was a golden eagle uh, and got very excited. Uh, except that it was a blue jay. <laughs> I'm hanging out with a mockingbird. So uh, <laughs> false alarm there, but it sounded pretty epic. Um, but yeah, there's, there's um, the, the golden eagles of Bernheim. It's, it's actually really neat. And um, there's a, um, Dottie, I think has a link to, um, she might share in the chat for you all. There's a link to a story can about I, them and can I information. Jump? It's really cool. We're hearing something really cool that I'm going to see if y'all can pick up. We're hearing pine siskins. Um, and they have this really cool call that it's like a, a zipper sound ascending. It goes zzzz. I want to see if we can get close to it here. Of course, it's going to stop since we made Freya stop talking. <laughs> Darn it, we're not hearing it now. I heard it, I heard it. I heard one. Color, color blue jays in Texas mimic siskins. 
Uh, Virginia said to tell you that in Texas, our blue jays will mimic the siskins also, but we definitely heard pine siskins. Um, I'm going to jump back in. Interrupt me if you hear them again. Um, I'm just at a little overlook of a little kind of pond, um, and I just wanted to um, show these railings because there's lots of different ways you can create barriers and railings on um, boardwalks and, and overlooks. And these, these, with this thick wire, um, it allows a lot of people to see. And then the top, the, you know, the top bit, at the, the thickest bit is, is oh, maybe three inches high. So even if that was right at your eye line, you've probably got half a chance of being able to see above or below it. Sometimes that top bar is really, really deep and it's going to really me mess with your ability to see over and actually see the thing that you're supposed to be able to see. So this is a really great example of how to do this, do this really well. So I just wanted to point that out while I was here. Hi, how are you? Cute puppy. I just now, um, actually, since we're all doing a lot of uh, birding by ear at the moment, a red-shouldered hawk just flew over and kind of on the topic of blue jays, blue jays, despite not being technically, you know, mockingbirds or parrots or anything, they are stellar mimics um, and will oftentimes have you thinking you're hearing one thing when in fact you're just hearing a blue jay. And here in Georgia, we so frequently get blue jays mimicking red shouldered hawks, um, which is, you always kind of have to, you, as you hear it more often, you kind of get to, to hearing, okay, that was a blue jay pretending to be a red shouldered hawk. But red shouldered hawks are absolutely beautiful, stunning birds. They're my favorite raptors. They've got um, some beautiful black and white stripes on her wings. Oh. Hear that? Ah! Um, yes, beautiful uh, stripes on their wings. They've got a nice red breast and they're oftentimes found near water, right? They, they like to hunt prey that are found near water. So you'll see them near wetlands, um, near streams. So um, if you hear a loud bird of prey near some, some water and you're in the Southeast or in Georgia in particular, you might be having a red-shouldered hawk on your hands. Okay, Virginia, are you seeing something cool over there? You're unmuted. Oh, um, I actually don't have anything to report right now. Let's go to Spray or Joe. I also, really quickly though, um, I wanted to, there are two things. One, can you tell them about the special towhee that you saw last week? Because for me, that like blew my mind. So could you tell them about that real quick? You, yeah. Um, uh, wait, the remind me. The green tail toy? The green tail toy? Yes. The green tail yes. toy. Oh, the green tail toy in Arizona? Oh, you were in Arizona. That's right. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, we have them here. That's right. They're, they're always like, <laughs> yeah, such a cool bird. You hear chickadees here in Carolina Rins and Pine Systems and. No green tail toes here yet, though. I'll let you know when they come. We're hearing a Carolina chickadee. We don't have black cat chickadees here. They look almost identical to the ones we have here at Carolina chickadees. And they just, they move constantly to us. I can't get them in the scope to show you a close up. That's right. Yeah, I've been hearing some Carolina chickadees. Yeah, and I thought I had them too. And then you said you had them. So I, I was looking around like, where are the chickadees? But no, that was just me hearing your chickadees. That's excellent. <laughs> Um, the second thing that I wanted to uh, ask if you would bring up, I believe, Virginia, I heard you talking about this during Bird Ability Week this year. Um, so kind of on the topic of, you know, when you are on a trail, especially a trail that's labeled as accessible, and you find some element of it that creates an accessibility challenge for, for, for people. Um, I know, Virginia, you were able to have some, some success in, you know, contacting the people. And Joe, you just described as well. Um, would you mind uh, kind of just telling people you know, why it's important for them to share if they see an accessibility issue on a trail that's labeled as accessible or otherwise, um, you know, how you can share that information with the people who can do something about it and the success that you've had doing that. Oh, right. All right. So um, I'd like to just talk for a second about a really wonderful place in the valley. This is the best example, I think, Karina, of what you're talking about. Um, I went down to a valley and went to a McAllen Nature Center. And um, the woman there told me she wasn't sure how accessible it was. And I told her I'd let her know. And so after a couple of hours wheeling around there, I made some notes and came back and talked to her. And I always basically begin that conversation in a really happy, joyful way, um, sharing with them all of the ways in which that trail 
met my needs and all of the ways in which it was so satisfying. And then I very happily move into the joyful, uh, the joys, I call it the joy of improvement. <laughs> and I just talk about the ways in which with the help of their communities that we can make this site a little more accessible for everybody. So what I do immediately is brainstorm with them, people, uh, organizations in the community that would be very willing right now to step up and contribute to helping make that site one of the, what do we call it? One of the highlights of the community, um, especially since EDI is such a big buzzword, a buzz phrase, a buzz concept right now. The point is that we make it a happy, constructive and joyful conversation. There's no contempt, there's no condemnation. It's all good. Thanks. And I'll just add in there, um, on, on the Vertibility website, under guidance documents, um, there's a template to advocate for accessible improvements in your local community. So it's based off a letter that, or an email that Virginia had sent and another one of our friends, Sarah Midler, who um, both separately had sent emails to um, a local nature center or park saying, hey, look, you know, I really love this place, but this thing just wasn't accessible. And this is how I would suggest you might think about improving it. And both of them had success. Both places were like, oh gosh, thanks so much for telling us. Like we really appreciate it. And they they fixed it. So um, there's a mashup of those two letters with, a, and it's a template. You can download it as a Word document, fill in all the bits, the park you're at, your name, you know, all that stuff um, and and email it uh, and see, see what happens. You might, you, you might change the world. And also, and also, you guys, you know what we're finding? This is just a very happy byproduct of the birdability map, that maps are now, or um, uh, locations are now contacting me and saying, we want to be on the map. What can we do to be on the map? And I say, I would love to have you on the map. I'll do whatever I can to help you get on the map. But these are the things we need to address before that can happen. Yay. Hey guys, I'll throw one thing out in terms of uh, of that, uh, and it's it's I've I've worked in the tourism industry for a number of years, and one of the key ingredients is I think most people that talk about their trails as being accessible believe confidently that they are accessible, and they want them to be accessible. So if you find a trail that's labeled as accessible, and you tell the people that call it an accessible trail that it's not perfectly accessible, they're probably going to want to fix it. And one of the reasons is is that if 10 people find something that they like at a location, they may tell somebody, ooh, I think somebody's digiscoping something there. So, um, but if you, if you tell, if 10 people tell you, I love this place, you might go there. But if one person tells you it's terrible and it's not living up to the expectations that you have, uh, it really hurts the location a lot. So I think people want to make sure people um, are happy and enjoying their location. So. That's, that's just sort of a little aside there. We're hearing, hearing a Carolina Wren fuss, fuss, fuss um, at something. And we're watching a, an American coot dive in and out of the water. But every time we try to focus on it, it focuses on the grass. So we haven't been able to show you yet. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. I, I just learned something. We have a ton of activity from. Oh, oh go ahead. Okay, I'll go, real quick. I am surrounded by a cacophony of uh, Carolina chickadees and um, Carolina wrens right now, who, of course, now that I'm talking, are completely silent. That's just what birds do, right? When you need them to, to sing and call, they don't do it. But there is a lot of activity going on right now. And I will say, if you are in the um, Atlanta area, I'm at Panola Mountain State Park, which is about 30 minutes south of downtown Atlanta. And this park is a really incredible location, especially during migration for warblers, um, even during the winter for sparrows and, um, and kinglets, like golden crown and ruby crown kinglets both. Um, and the trail here is um, paved for, for several miles. And just to show you, um, it is a pretty wide trail. If I had to guess the width, it looks like it's a, about eight or so feet wide. Um, and there are parking spots available for um, people who experience accessibility challenges. There are two handicapped spots. The, the, the parking lot is gravel, but the spots are paved. Um, that leads directly to the trailhead. So I would definitely encourage you to come check it out. Freya, I know you're about to say something, so go ahead and uh, jump in. Sorry about that. We started talking at the same time. No worries, no worries. The birds trump whatever I was going to say. Um, 
I was just going to say thanks, Joe, because I just learned something there about how to advocate for accessibility improvements from your experience in the tourism industry. Um, I'm definitely going to be sending an email to the lovely folks here at Bernheim about the trail that I just wandered along this morning and, and suggest some um, improvements they may like to make. Um, we're just walking past some very scenic. I call them portaloos. I'm from Australia, so I say things different. I know you all call them different things, but um, I know I know this is like super not that interesting, except that I'm just really pleased to see that there's you know a, a regular sized um, portaloo and there's there's the extra big, more more likely to be more accessible one, and I think that's great. I think if you have one, you probably should have both. Um, and I'm not going to show you inside because you'll probably know what a portaloo looks like on the inside. But it you know it has enough. The reason they have to be so big is so that folks who have um, mobility devices like wheelchairs or walking frames, there's enough circulation space in there for them to get around and maneuver around to transfer onto the actual toilet um, and grab rails to, to help them do that. So that's um, that's great to see. I'm really pleased that, that I'm seeing that. Um, I also wanted to point out the benches. There's, I'm on a different trail now, just below the visitor center. And there's, uh, oh, sorry. There's, there's, there's a whole bunch of benches along here, which is lovely. But if it, in an ideal world, these benches, it would be paved where like, you know, the, the trail in, that I'm on is paved, but then you go onto grass to get to the bench. And if you have, um, if it's muddy because it's been raining like it has been today, or, you know, that that's actually not the most accessible. It could be, if, or it could just be pulled back a little onto this super wide trail and it would be easier for people to get to. So just um, pointing that out, this little pond. So Bernheim, I'm gonna shout out the forest giants. There's three forest giants at Bernheim. Um, forest giant, they're, they're like troll. I, I think they're trolls, but they're called forest giants. They're beautiful wooden structures, um, sculptures even made from um, recycled timber. There's three different ones. The trail to get to the three of them is not accessible. <laughs> Sections of it are a little bit, but uh, I'm just over here near near little Nils. Uh, he's he's over there. I'll see if I can get a bit closer to him, but he's uh, gazing into the water, just enjoying his reflection. I know there's a bunch of turtles and stuff in this pond. I don't, I don't know what species they are, I'm sorry, but yeah, kind of fun. Joe, do you have something in the camera? Oh, maybe not, okay. <laughs> I saw his camera pop up. Um, yeah, so one thing that I would definitely encourage and has been said already, but I wanted to reiterate, um, Birdability has a an incredible number of resources um, for making the outdoors, birding, outdoor recreation accessible. Oh, Downy Woodpecker, right on cue. That was great, thank you. Um, <laughs> so making the outdoors more accessible uh, for everybody. And I want to encourage everyone, whether you have an accessibility challenge or not, to really dig in and, and participate in that surveying. Um, Birdability has partnered with National Audubon to basically have an interactive map so that if you're at a trail or if you're at a, a birding spot, you can submit a survey about that location so that someone who, for example, wants to know if a, if, if a trail is accessible um, for someone in a wheelchair, um, they can know that before they go and they can be aware of the places that are accessible and have more access therefore to nature and outdoor exploration. And it only takes like a couple of minutes to do. So if you're outside birding or just walking around, pull out your phone and real quick submit that survey. It's on Birdability's website. It's very easy and it has such an incredible impact on the accessibility of outdoors, of the outdoors and of birding. So I definitely want to encourage you to, again, visit birdability.org and take a look at those resources, specifically the map where you can submit surveys about the accessibility of a trail. Okay. Hey, can I say something? Um, yes. that, that becomes especially important. I was in Seattle three years ago and I called Seattle Audubon before I went and I asked them about accessible trails and no one had any idea what trails were accessible. One person guessed at Discovery Park. So I got on a public bus and rode for 45 minutes to Discovery Park only to find that it was completely inaccessible. So this is a perfect, perfect example of how important it is to help people know where the accessible parks are before they go. And just to thank you, thank you, Karina, just for that for that big shout out. So just just in case there's any confusion, so the birdability map is where you can read about the different um, birding locations that have been pinned there. In order to pin a location, you complete a birdability site review. Um, the reason that I'm pointing this out is because we also, right now, until the 15th, you've got three days, um, there's a birdability birders survey, which is also linked on our website. 
which is actually about the people, not the location. So if you experience an accessibility challenge, we really want to hear from you. And it's the, so the Birdability Birders Survey is, is asking questions about what sort of things um, make a place accessible for you. So that and, and what things what things need improvement, uh, improving not just at accessible trails, but also in the bright, sorry, in the wider birding community, like maybe you're deaf and you really like tuning into your local Audubon chapters webinars, but they don't have closed captions. That makes it inaccessible. We, we want to hear about that so we know where to focus. Um, so just a shout out for that, Birdability Birders Survey until the, December 15th. Um, I also just want to quickly shout out, I'm wearing our, the brand new Rogue Birders Birdability Braille Bird On hoodie. Um, I'm being laughed at by Virginia and by Chris at Rogue Birders because I haven't actually taken it off except to go to bed since I received it two weeks ago. We just partnered with Rogue Birders who are super awesome. You should check out their website and their um, Instagram uh, and their Facebook page. Um, really cool group of people um, shouting out and highlighting diverse birders and birders who are helping contribute to birding and conservation. And all the funds that um, were raised from selling these hoodies and t-shirts are coming to us for birdability and they'll be available again next time road birders open their store so it's super cool it says it says bird on in braille on the front and so someone who reads braille wouldn't be able to read this but that's okay this is actually really for sighted birders to or sighted um, potential future birders to come and ask and be like hey what's that thing on your shirt and you can start talking about inclusivity and diversity and accessibility and birding and it'll be a great conversation so it's really I, really cool my, i want uh, our next i want our next garment to be pajamas for freya <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, then I can wear 24 seven. That's a great idea, Virginia, I love it. Um, Chris, Rogue Birders, if you're listening, there you go, there's the, there's the next idea. <laughs> Here I am, I'm just showing you because it's fun. Here's little Nils, the, the forest giant, um, enjoying, enjoying his reflection in the pond. There were a couple of mallards out here earlier. They seem to have headed off. Um, we've had a belt of kingfisher I'm out here before and a great blue heron, so really nice. And I'm going to jump in. This is Virginia and Celeste. Um, we've been hearing a red-bellied woodpecker flying around us. He keeps moving before we can get our eyes on him, but it's just a great example of, of how fun it can be to a bird's ear because we hear it even though we can't see it. So, you know, we know it's up here and that's exciting. And just as a, um, the birding does seem to be picking up here a little bit. We just had two gulls fly over. I'm thinking they were hearing gulls, but I'm not sure. Um, and we just had a belted kingfisher come through. So that was kind of exciting. And we got something over there and a black and a, um, maybe a red winged blackbird there, but so that was kind of fun, but blue jay. I know, I, I know we're getting close to, um, to time. Um, I just want to mention that these um, Georgia Audubon and Birdability Accessible Virtual Bird Addings will be continuing every month. Um, all across the country, like Karina said, it will start highlighting different accessible trails and different birders who have accessibility challenges. And I'm really looking forward to learning from different birders and going birding in different places without having to go very far myself. I'm really looking forward to it. So huge shout out to George Audubon. Um, it's, this is super cool. Um, and if you, if I mean, if you're watching this, it's probably not helpful information, but we are going to have the recordings of these available uh, by the Birdability website. So that's going to be really great too. And kind of a bit of a resource as well, if people want to learn a bit more or, um, delve a bit more into into that so uh, yeah check out our website there is lots of good stuff on it we, we're working really hard to get more up there um so it can be a really great resource um, about inclusion and accessibility and diversity and being at the outdoors so i just wanted to to mention that before before time's up Absolutely. Thank you so much, Freya. And to let you know, we are um, scheduling these monthly virtual bird outings with BirdAbility on the second Saturdays of the month. And so the next one is going to be on January 9th. Um, so you'll be seeing information um, get distributed about that, who will have on, uh, where they'll be birding from. And again, it's really cool to not only be able to, of course, hear about and maybe even see if the birds sit still, <laughs> the birds that you can, you know, see across the country if you ever get the, the chance to visit these locations, um, but also talk about the various perspectives of people who experience different accessibility challenges when we're outdoors, um, because that is a very essential, essential, central, and important part 
of making birding and outdoor exploration accessible for everybody and all kinds of people. Um, so I do wanna thank everyone who is a guest today, uh, Freya, Virginia, uh, Linda and Joe, thank you so much for joining us and Dottie for um, hosting this and Celeste. Karina, um, this, Karina yeah. can, I, can I just interrupt and say that we, we are recording this as well and we will download the recording. Of course, the, the Facebook Live portion will stay live on our, on our Georgia Audubon Facebook page so anybody can watch it, but we'll also download it and put it on our YouTube channel and share it with you guys so that y'all can put it wherever you need it. Absolutely. So thank you yeah, everyone. Oh, oh, yes, go ahead, Joe. Sorry, just one last quick thing. Just, um, I wanted to mention that this location is on the Alabama Birding Trails program. Um, there are 280 locations around the state of Alabama and we are working really hard to document the accessibility of every trail in Alabama uh, as best we can. So if, there is a website, alabamabirdingtrails.com um, that you can find a lot more about birding in Alabama. So come on over. I'm putting up a link to that website right now, Joe. Hold on, bear with me. And yeah. my final farewell, I just had um, a ruby crown kinglet getting chased by a golden crown kinglet. I've never <gasps> seen them chasing each other before. They just flew right in front of me into this um, cedar, some kind of a cedar tree. I'm not going to plant, but that was really awesome. So finishing on a high note over here. <laughs> Amazing. We love ending on some bird drama. Um, Virginia, did you have anything that you wanted to say? I saw that you were unmuted. Yeah, yes. I wanted to say, wait, is it over? <laughs> no, we're just beginning. We got another hour or two or three on the trail. <laughs> Thank you. I know. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Freya. Thank you, Joe. It's fun. Thanks, y'all. Great. Looking forward to seeing you next month. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks y'all.